Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Julie Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. New stories are posted every month on the second Sunday at 2.30 p.m. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube page or following our Facebook. As a reminder, some stories contain adult language and content. It is recommended you review stories before allowing younger audiences to listen. This is Birds in the House by Kevin Wilson. The men in my family gather at Oak Hall this morning to make birds. They sit in the dining room at an antique oak table and carefully fold their paper cranes. My father and his three brothers fold tiny pieces of papers, squares of yellows and pinks and whites and blues and greens, so thin that light passes through them as if they aren't there at all. I watch the brothers' hands, calloused and big like sledgehammers, as they struggle not to tear the cranes, not to snap a neck or rip a wing. My uncle Mizell, pressing his oval glasses back onto the bridge of his nose with his thumb, talks about how Mama always made us do this horse shit, fold up birds for sick neighbors, burn my ass to sit there all day and make these things. My father looks up from his bird and scowls at his brother. Show a little respect, jackass. Fold your son of a bitch birds and we can get this over with. He looks over at me, seated at the far end of the table beside the lawyer, and shakes his head. He does not like being here, I can tell. None of the brothers look happy with the situation. Uneasy and wary of their close proximity to one another. They have shown up only because of the will. Until, until her death 11 days ago, my grandmother, Nobia Collier, lived at Oak Hall, a dilapidated plantation in Middle Tennessee, built by my great-great-great-great-grandfather, General Felix Collier of the Confederate Army. The walls are soft from rot and feel like sponge against my fingers. The wood floors have warped slightly, each plank curling up at the ends like a half-smile. It has seen better days, as has the Collier name. After the general died, a shot in the back on a failed charge at the Battle of Mill Springs, his five children spent the next 40 years fighting over who would get the mansion. The eldest brother was killed, one of the sisters jailed for shooting him, and another sister wandered out into the fields one night and never returned. Finally, the fourth-born, Dwight Collier, a crooked lawyer who had been living in Mason, Tennessee, took up residence at Oak Hall until his death at which time the property was passed down to his oldest son, a slightly less crooked county executive. Since then, squabbles have erupted from time to time, siblings arguing over who should get what, the money in the family slowly drying up. Folks in Tennessee now say the Colliers are bad news with 400 acres, but Oak Hall is all we have left, and so it's not hard to understand why the brothers are gathered here today taking silent measurements of the house, one of them will win, wondering where the TV and sofas will go. We are all here to settle my grandmother's estate, which consists of the property of Oak Hall and some minor stocks and bonds. There is a small amount of money, but nearly all of that will pay legal fees and taxes. The brothers are here as participants in a contest. The lawyer, a thin man with pointy ears who twirls his pocket watch by its chain, is here to oversee the event. I am here because at 12 years old, I'm the oldest grandchild, and because my presence was stipulated in her will. The paper cranes and fans are her ideas as well. The brothers don't get along. They meet once a year at the mansion for the family reunion, playing lawn darts and eating cured ham, and drinking whiskey until one of the brothers mentions some ancient grievance. Then we all form a circle around the combatants and watch them roll around on the grass until the police show. With my grandmother's passing, they will no longer keep in touch. They will see each other in hell, according to my Uncle Bit. My grandmother, understanding this rift between the brothers, this genetic hatred for family that runs through the Colliers, decided that one brother, only one, will receive the inheritance. There will be a contest whose outcome I will determine and the winner will take this house and the other men will return home and live their lives joined in a collective hatred for that one brother. We will circle around the oak table, a table that was big enough to seat more than 50 guests in better times, where 1,000 paper cranes will be placed, 250 for each brother. 
These cranes will then be moved around the table by the force of four giant fans positioned at each corner of the room until only one paper crane is left on the table. The owner of that single bird will receive the mansion. However, before any of this occurs, the brothers must make their cranes, all 1,000, by hand. It is what my grandmother wanted. It was her desire, her one last hope, for the brothers to gather here in the house they once shared, to make birds out of paper, and maybe find something decent in one another that would sustain them. The men in my family are not doing a good job so far. I want to believe that my grandmother could find no other way to make sure that we all came together than to create such an elaborate game. Unavoidable hours around a table, faced with the finality of the decision, the possibility of losing this house, perhaps she hoped they would come to their senses and make one last attempt at reconciling. And yet, it makes me sad to think that maybe my grandmother, tired from years of unhappiness, had given in to whatever runs in the collier blood that makes us hurt one another. There are 487 paper cranes scattered across the table and floor of the dining room. The brothers soak their hands in salt water after 20 birds or so, cracking their knuckles and necks and backs and anything else they can get a sound out of. I walk around the room, gathering cranes in the giant wicker basket, checking each bird's left wing for the black marker initials of one of the brothers. When I bend over to pick up one of the cranes, my uncle Bit flicks my ear. This is the extent of our relationship. He flicks my ear at reunions 20, 30 times throughout the day. Sometimes he'll hide behind trees, wait behind doors until I come out and he'll flick my ear with a sharp thwack and run away laughing to himself. When I look up, he is concentrating on his crane, trying not to smile. My father says Bit is just plain mean, always unhappy, acting as if God keeps poking him in the back. He's the most well-off of the brothers, working a successful tobacco farm at Robertson County. And though he doesn't need any money or plan to live in the mansion if he wins, he sure as hell doesn't want anyone else to have it. I watch him fold the paper into itself, trying to get the creases right. And then he sets the bird down and shakes the soreness out of his hands. Working in the sun for so many years has left Bit permanently sunburned. The sun has bled into his skin so that he is stained red. When he shakes his hands, it looks like two cardinals flying. I carry the basket over to the lawyer, seated at the far end of the table, and dump the birds at his feet. The lawyer, a Mr. Callahan from somewhere up north, has long legs, almost obscenely long, and as he tallies each paper crane in his book, they cross and uncross over each other. He is noticeably excited about the contest. He keeps checking his watch, twirling it for a few seconds, and then bringing it back to his face. I sit beside him to rest before I start gathering birds again, and I watch the brothers. My grandmother came to Tennessee from the east. She was not a native southerner, the first collier in family history not to hail from below the Mason-Dixon line. My grandfather, Tom Collier, met her while in the Navy, stationed in Japan just after the Korean War. They hired Japanese teenagers to clean barracks, and he would watch her changing bed sheets, sweeping the floors. She would smile at him as she worked, when he would lift his legs for her to sweep under. Pretty soon, he was leaving little gifts for her on his pillow, chocolate and necklaces, a silver lighter. In return, she placed paper objects on the sheets of his bed, origami birds and bears and ships. She liked the way he talked. The slow, easy way of his words came out, and even though she could hardly understand a word, she knew he said good things, and that was enough. When his time was up, time to go back to Tennessee and Oak Hall, she came with him. The Collier name slipped even further around town to the point where there wasn't any reason in trying to bring it back to a respectable level. So my grandfather bought a couple liquor stores, and she swept the floors and changed bed sheets in the giant house. The four boys were born, and he sat on the front porch and sipped whiskey, and she gradually learned to understand what it was he was saying. Learned the things he said weren't as nice as they had been overseas. And this is how my grandmother spent most of her life, figuring out things at Oak Hall weren't as nice as they had been. My uncle Tetsuya, who will answer only to Sue, though he was named after my grandmother's father, finishes his 250 cranes first and spends the rest of the time wandering around the living room, 
hovering over the other brothers. He is nervous, chewing a plug of beech nut and spitting it into a plastic cup. He walks with me for a while, helps me load the basket with birds, but soon grows tired of this and hovers over Uncle Mazel. Mazel is the biggest of the brothers, nearly 300 pounds, with arms that look like they could uproot things, trees and telephone poles. He is so big, he has to use a machine to help him breathe at night. His third wife is doing five months for unplugging it late one evening. He keeps a towel around his neck to wipe away sweat that trickles down his face and glasses in steady streams. After a few minutes of Sue's beginning to speak and then thinking better of it, stopping with a quick cough, Mazel spins around and stares him down. Fairies finish first, that's what I heard. Sue backs up, still coughing words away. Sue runs a near bankrupt company that makes chocolate shaped like old comic characters. White chocolate cats and jammer kids, little abners made with crisped rice, a nougat filled Barney Google. He has no money. People apparently don't want to eat beloved comic characters or else don't remember them. Now he spends a lot of time looking over his shoulder as if a creditor is hiding behind a door. He shoves another tobacco plug into his mouth and sits far away from the other brothers. Mazel finally turns back to his work, tosses another bird on the floor and mutters, burns my ass all of this. As the brothers grew older, my grandmother became even more confused, watching these boys of hers run around in summer months with no shoes or shirts, constantly carrying BB guns and hunting knives. They didn't mind her, and she wasn't sure how to go about making them listen. People in town called them yellow trash, and this only made the boys pellet their houses even more. My grandfather just drank on the porch and said, boys shoot things, honey, that's what they do. They had sunburned skin and fine black hair with rat tails. They fought constantly with jeering kids and when there were no more left to beat up, with one another. I think about my grandmother sweating in the humid August air and staring out the windows at ragged boys who were half hers kick and bite one another with a ferocity that was nearly joyful. And I think about her staring past the boys past the mountains on the horizon, and thinking about somewhere else, somewhere far away. I move beside my father as he finishes the last of the cranes. I cannot help him fold birds. My grandmother's instructions do not allow me to help. So I sit and watch his face, unblinking and staring hard at the paper. It almost looks like concentration, like he has focused on the birds, yet I know he isn't. I have seen this look many times in the past year, of staring beyond things in front of him. It reminds me of last year on the cattle farm, of the coolness that should not have been there in late August, the wind coming in from the north. An electric fence was knocked out in a storm, something my father noticed and yet neglected to fix. The cows crossed over into another farmer's patch of crimson clover, where they ate and ate for two days before my father and I saw them grazing in the field. They'd gotten the bloat from the clover, swollen up until there wasn't anywhere for the skin to go but out. Cows exploded, actually opened up like popped balloons, and they fell over on one side, insides scattered around them. We tried to save the rest, walked them around like crazy to work off the pressure in their stomachs. My father grabbed my sharp finger blade and slammed it just above the cow's front quarter, all the way to the hill, and then pulled it out, trying to open up air passages but nothing helped. The crimson clover had settled too far inside them and we stood around the field for another two days, cows exploding all around us. Finally, my father gave up, went into the house for the Colt 45 and put a bullet between the, cow, the eyes of every cow still standing until he stood in a cloud of red tinged dust. My father used to be a good man a hard worker, but after the cows, he started to drink more, leased out most of our land to farmers, and kept just enough to get by. He spent long afternoons on the front porch, drinking whiskey splashed with sweet tea, and staring out at that field, at the filled-in ditch where we buried the dead cattle. Around the house, he wouldn't stay in the same room as us anymore, seemed shocked when he happened upon my mom or me, as if he'd forgotten that we existed. One morning, I woke to find my mother gone and my father out on the porch drunk. Where's mom? I asked, but he didn't say anything. I asked again. He, he put his index finger to his lips to quiet me. I sat down beside him and stared out across the field. After an hour, he finally stirred, leaned toward me and said, your mom decided that she needed to be away for a while. 
I wondered why she hadn't taken me, and then, as if he knew what I had been thinking, he said, I told her that she couldn't take you. I said I wouldn't let you go anywhere. You and me have to stay together, even if neither one of us wants to be here. He started to put his arm around me, and then stopped, as if he couldn't understand how to proceed. And then, finally, awkwardly, he let his arm fall across my shoulders. If my father wins the mansion, he tells me, that he'll fix it up, and then my mother will come back to us. He says that we will have the chance to start over. He will also build a giant wall to keep my uncles out, protecting us from everyone else with our last name. We will sit in the living room and watch football games on a large screen TV that fills an entire wall. We will dip the winning crane in bronze and keep it on the mantle, where we will stare at it during commercials. I want my mother to come back, though I feel that she has done what my grandmother could never do, has escaped from the Collier name, and I cannot imagine any amount of hoping that could bring her back to us. There are very few pieces of my grandmother that rubbed off on the brothers. They eat pork rinds wrapped in seaweed. That's about it. They know almost nothing of Japan, of my grandmother's life before she came to Oak Hall. They do not speak a word of Japanese, save for a few curse words that they coaxed out of her to impress other kids at school. They do not remember what all these cranes mean, that a thousand cranes will bring happiness and a long life to those who make them, and those they make them for. They remember only the embarrassment of dragging sacks of paper birds down dirt roads to neighbors who were near death, of offering all these folded pieces of colored paper to baffled stairs. I don't want anything to do with your mama's slant-eyed voodoo. Just get those things away from me, they would hear. And the brothers would carry them down to the creek, watch them float in the current before they ducked under the water, all those paper cranes sinking and washing away. And whether they liked it or not, the brothers were half Japanese rednecks in an unhappy family, and it must have been nice to watch something stay above water even for just a few seconds. When Mazel finishes his last crane, the lawyer and I gather all the cranes, checking the book one last time to make sure we have counted correctly. The brothers mill around the lawyer, jostling one another, watching to see that no one grabs someone else's crane and pockets it. Sue, I swear to God, I will rip your arms out like a goddamn weed if you take your hand out of your pocket one more time. And Bit looks ready to do it, no longer caring about the contest, just wanting the chance to hit one of his brothers over the head with his own arm. I'll place my hands where I damn well please. If you've forgotten last year when you knocked the phone out of my hands and what you got, I'll make you remember pretty damn quick. I remember that it was my father who knocked the phone away. But I don't say anything. Don't remind Sue that my dad knocked out one of his teeth, where it stuck deep in the skin of his fist like a splinter. However, before anyone can remind anyone of anything, the lawyer looks up from the book. Gentlemen, the tally is correct and we can get on with this contest. Or, if you have more important business to take care of, we can wait. The brothers grow quiet, step away from the lawyer as if he has drawn a pistol. When the lawyer stands, uncrosses his legs, and lifts himself out of his chair, we all hear the sound of paper crinkling, skipping across the floor. The lawyer lifts one of his feet and sees a crane stuck to his shoe under his heel and sighs, a deep, long sigh that feels like it will go until he has no more breath in his body when he finishes. He peels the crane off his shoe and holds it up, examines the initials MC on the wing. It seems I have miscalculated or there is a renegade bird here. I have to do a recount now to ensure that each of you has no more or less than 250 birds. It will take a few minutes, a half hour maybe. You are free to resume your business, eat or drink or take a short nap if you choose. The brothers eye one another, no one wanting to be the first to leave the room, to leave their cranes unguarded. But finally, my father places his hands on my shoulder and says, Let's get us some refreshment, Smokey, a little pre-celebration drink. And with that, all the brothers scatter throughout the house to wait, to look again at what may soon be theirs. I do not remember much about my grandmother. I saw her only a few times in my life. I remember that even though my father looked different from most of the men in Franklin County, slightly exotic in some way, he still, still didn't look much like her. Her hair was jet black, even in her old age her skin yellow-brown. To entertain me, she would let me point to objects in the house, and then she would fold paper into that shape, 
placing the finished product in my hand and waiting for me to pick the next thing. She showed me how to make the cranes and told me the story of their collective power as we filled the floor with what we'd made together, my single crane matching every seven of hers. Once she took out a photo album and showed me a picture of her and my grandfather in Japan, both wearing kimonos and sitting on a rug. She looked beautiful, her hair pulled into a bun and her face calm and clear. My grandfather looked less comfortable, his kimono puffing at the shoulders, his face twisted to one side embarrassed like he had been caught trying on pantyhose and a dress. I asked her if she was happy that she'd left, and she told me, one place as good as another, but sometimes I think some places may be a little better. My father sits on a stool in the kitchen, swirling the last bits of whiskey left in his glass. His arm is around my shoulder and he is smiling, but I can see his eyes are still far away. You okay, Smokey? A lot to take in, ain't it? I know it's been a tough year for us, but things gonna get better. I promise you that. Now, here's the thing, Smokey. Maybe I win, and maybe not. That's why it's called a contest. But I want you to take this, just to have, just in case. He reaches down and unrolls his left sock, producing two cranes from the hiding spot. The birds are bright yellow with his initials on the left wing black ink so dark it looks like it has been branded into the birds. Where did you get those? I ask, and he smiles. I made them, he says. I made them when nobody was looking, and now I'm giving them to you. He hands them, them, to, hands them to me, but I shake my head. We have to play by the rules, I say, and the look on my father's face, the way he, his eyes turn to slits, makes me feel ashamed, as if I am going against the true nature of things. These are the new rules I'm giving you he tells me, the birds now barely touching my chest. You take these birds, and near the end, when things thin out, you get real close to the table and let these birds onto the table. It's not cheating, really. Those birds still have to stay on the table, right? The plan can end in nothing but failure. The brothers yanking me out of the house and into the yard, accusations, more fighting. But he is my father. He is my family, what's left of it. And though I don't like it, it is what's true. I take the birds from him, carefully fold the wings to meet each other, and slip them into the pocket of my jeans. I look to him, but he doesn't say anything else. He finishes his drink and sits staring out across the kitchen. The lawyer calls us back into the dining room. The count is correct. Everything is ready to go. I begin dumping baskets of paper cranes onto the table, watch them scatter across the oak finish. It is hard to keep them all on the table, takes several tries to get them settled. But when it is done, the lawyer takes one last look at his watch and nods. Around the table, there are four fans set up, large metal fans that my father says look a lot like those fans they use on chicken farms, big sun bitches that blow trees down. The fans are all rigged to one control box whose switch I will flip, starting with the low setting before clicking up to medium and then high. The brothers stand together in a line on one side of the table, staring down at their birds, trying to figure out which ones are theirs. But there are so many, so many colors that it's impossible to know. Their faces are frozen in tight grimaces, as if the skin around their mouths and eyes is shrinking. When everyone is ready, the lawyer looks at the brothers, looks to me one last time, and says, begin. I click the fans on, listen to them slowly hum. It feels like a slight breeze, and the cranes move slowly around the table, vibrating on the surface like plastic players on an electric football game. Several of the cranes already fall to the ground, tap the wood floors with bent beaks and broken wings. Uncle Bit falls to his knees and picks up the birds, checking each one for initials, yelling out either, Hell yes, motherfucker, or God damn it all, motherfucker, depending on what letters he sees. I click the setting to medium, and now the birds are really moving, skittering across the table more quickly than before. The floor is filling up with discarded birds. All the brothers are now on hands and knees, crawling around the table in search of initials, elbowing one another out of the way, pulling hair. Sue kicks out behind him and catches Bit neatly between the eyes, a red print of a loafer forming like a stripe down his face. More cranes slip off the edge and hover for a few seconds before touching the ground. My father and Uncle Mazel wrestle for a bird, ripping it into tiny shreds in the process. 
Bit stands up and runs into the hallway for a chair, returning quickly to break it over Sue's back, sending splinters of wood into the air with the paper birds. I click the setting to its final place on high, and the fan roars, pitch birds around and around the table like things trapped in the center of a tornado. I can hear cursing under the table, the sound of fists smacking against faces and arms and stomachs, yelps of pain. My father is now riding Mazelle like a cowboy on a bucking bronc, digging his heels into Mazelle's kidneys and screaming, Get along, little doggies! Sue has taken his belt off and cracks it like a bullwhip across Bit's back. The lawyer stands in the frame of the door and twirls his watch, his eyes lit up like a man looking through a peephole. Birds are everywhere, flying to certain death off the edge, hovering two feet over the table or holding fast to the oak finish. Even cranes that have already fallen to the ground have been picked up again by the fans so that it's hard to tell where anything is anymore. It's just a thick cluster of colored paper birds. The brothers are still rolling around on the floor, covered in thin, bright red paper cuts. They occasionally stop pummeling one another to look up at the table and shout words of encouragement. Mazelle's head pops up like a groundhog and he screams, Hold on, you sons of bitches, hold on! And I lean forward, hands almost touching the table, and watch the swirling mist of colors of delicate paper cranes hovering, hanging, flying in the air. I sometimes have to hold my hands over my face to block cranes crashing into my head. The fans put out so much wind that it feels like a monsoon, like the whole house is going to lift off the ground and touch down somewhere else. The brothers are bleeding and bruised and screaming profanity like holy men speaking in tongues. The birds are flying, if only for a brief moment, and I watch a rainbow of cranes fly around the room, dip and loop and dive in the air. I reach into my pocket, feel the two cranes against my fingertips, but I can't release them. I look at my father, his shirt ripped and his back scratched red with jagged lines, and he is crawling across the ground while a swarm of birds shoot past him so quickly that it seems as if they are attacking him. I have seen my father fight with his brothers before, have grown accustomed to the sight of his broken fingers, swollen face, and busted lip, still smiling. But today, in the midst of these cranes, it seems especially ugly makes me sad that my father cannot share this moment with me. I'm afraid of what will happen if we do not win this house, but it is even harder to imagine my father and I, lo I alone in all of these rooms, filled with so much unhappiness. The cranes are still flying around the room, and even though I won't cheat, I can't deny these birds in my hands the chance to move on with the rest. I open my hands and let them take to the air, Watch them lift out of my grasp like baby birds flying for the first time, and their yellow shade mixes with the swirl of colored birds above me. And it is beautiful to watch these things, these tiny creatures move so quickly through the air, to watch them pick up speed and soar from the table like airplanes lifting off a runway. They take to the air and fly away, out of windows, through the hallway, into deep parts of the house where they will never be found. And then it happens, the crane, all the brothers stop mid-punch, release chokeholds. They remain on their knees, look up at the table with swollen eyes wide. The final crane, bright red, has been caught perfectly between the four fans, equidistant from each one. And this crane catches the wind and soars into the air, raises off the table, and still climbs higher. The brothers are motionless, cannot even curse in their wonder. There is no way to make out the initials. The crane hovers four feet above the table, caught between the fans so that it hovers, levitates without moving. I think it is amazing seeing something so beautiful flying inside the walls of Oak Hall. And for one moment, it is wonderful to watch this single paper crane hang in the air like a prayer, like hope, like a single breath. But when I look over at the brothers on hands and knees as if praying, I know that all they can see is the mansion the house that one of them will have when this bird touches down. They jab elbows into ribs, ball their hands into tight fists, and press the weight of their bodies into one another. They want only one thing, for that bird to fall, to drift beneath the current of the wind. They wait for the crane to dive back to the table, where they will rip it open, tear it apart for the answer. While I watch it hover, I want only for it to stay up there forever. The brothers are ready. 
watching it begin to wobble and lose flight. And just before it touches down, before the four brothers slam into one another to place their hands upon the paper crane, I think about my grandmother and hope that she is somewhere far away, somewhere that even birds cannot reach. I hope that she is happy.